Hi, my name is Tony Smith, and in this lesson we're going to look at a practical application of data mining in the world of biology, knowledge discovery with biological data, or so-called bioinformatics. Now there are many different types of biological problems that we might want to study, many different data types. I'm going to look at a uh, subset that's quite common called sequence analysis. So sequence of nucleotides that make up genes or sequences of amino acids that make up proteins. In fact, the latter. We're going to look at a very easily stated sequence uh, problem for proteins. It is, goes like this, given a freshly produced protein, which portion of it is the signal peptide? Now what does this mean? Well, you might remember from high school biology that along your DNA, there are nucleotide sequences called genes. Genes get copied with messenger RNA to produce a transcript, and that transcript is used to string together amino acids into a polypeptide chain, which is a protein. Now, proteins perform some function in a cell, and in order to do that, they must have to be transported to where they're going to perform that function. And through that transport, they have to pass through a membrane. And uh, in so doing, what happens is the uh, 20 or 30 or so amino acids at the beginning of the protein, they're called the signal peptide, they open up a translocation channel that allows the protein to pass through the membrane. And in so doing, the signal peptide portion gets cleaved off. So the signal peptide is kind of like a key that opens a door for a protein. And if we know what the key is, it gives us an idea as to what the function of the protein might be. So we want to predict where the signal peptide ends. Where is the cleavage point? And we first ask ourselves, what's our general goal? Do we want accurate prediction or do we want an explanatory model, something that gives us some knowledge? We'll have to ask what features might be relevant in predicting the cleavage site. So what features do we need to generate from the data we're given? What approach are we going to take? What learning algorithms in Weka we might use? And how are we going to know if the model produced by Weka is any good? How do we know if we're successful? So here's some uh, 10 instances or so of new proteins. As you can see, there's sequences of letters where each letter corresponds to a different type of amino acid. So M is methionine, A is alanine, S is serine, and so on. And about 25 or 30 residues along from the beginning of the protein, uh, marked in red here, is the cleavage site. That's the beginning of the mature protein, the part that survives after cleavage. And that's what we're trying to predict. Which of those residues is the cleavage site? So what properties do we think are relevant? Do we want properties of the entire signal peptide or just properties around the cleavage site? Uh, we might get some domain knowledge from a biologist to help us out, or we might do some ad hoc statistical analysis to look for things that might correlate with the cleavage site. For example, given the 1,400 examples in our data set, we might find that uh, there's a very tightly clustered length with a mean length of 24. So knowing the position of a residue might be useful in predicting whether or not it's the cleavage site. If we look at the residue at the start of the mature protein, and perhaps the three residues immediately upstream of the cleavage site, and the three residues downstream from it, there might be some useful information there, some context. In fact, if we do a histogram of the upstream region in the data we've got, We'll see that it looks like the letter A, alanine, and perhaps the letter L, and maybe S as well, seem to be quite frequent around the cleavage site. So that could be useful. So when we don't have domain, uh, much domain knowledge, we might come up with a set of features that include the position of the residue being considered, the residues at each position, three either side of the cleavage point, and then for each residue that we know is the cleavage site, we'll put that in the class of, yes, this is the cleavage point, and we'll just get some negative instances by randomly choosing some other residues and producing the same information. And we might do this inside a spreadsheet. Here's an example. So each column is an attribute, and each row is one instance of a residue. And we've recorded all this information. And this can be saved in a comma-separated version in most uh, spreadsheet packages. And uh, WEC, of course, can load a CSV package. So we're going to go ahead and load in this uh, data into Weka and have a go see if we can predict the cleavage site from it. So I've loaded up the data set that I just showed you into Weka. We see here we've got the features, the uh, length or the position of the acid in question, uh, which residue is at the minus 3 position, minus 2, minus 1, the residue at the cleavage site, and 1, 2, and 3 upstream. And I've recorded whether this is an example of the cleavage site or a randomly chosen other residue that's not. 
Now, if I go straight to classify, I want an explanatory model. So I'm going to go for a C4.5 decision tree. So I'll go down to trees, load up J48, which is C4.5. And under the default settings of 10 full cross validation, I'm just going to go ahead and start up Weka. It comes back pretty quickly. And if we look at the accuracy, we'll see we've got here 78, 79% accuracy. Now that's pretty good considering um, other state of the art software for predicting the signal uh, peptide cleavage point performs at about 80, 85% accuracy. So we've already done really well. But is this model any good? Now, if we look at the uh, true positive rates for the two classes, so here we've got the yes and no class. And if we look at the true positive rates, they're around 80%, so that's pretty good. So let's take a look at the decision tree produced. I'll just pop up the visualization of it, enlarge that a little bit, fit to the screen. Now, there's a couple of reasons why this decision tree suggests we haven't come up with a very good model. One is it's very wide and very shallow, and it's highly branching. Each of the tests seems to produce a lot of very small subsets. And this suggests that what we've done is we've actually uh, found a model that overfits the data. Now, what does that mean? Well, let me give you an example. Uh, machine learning algorithms are trying their best to get predictive accuracy, and it's often very easy for learning algorithms to find some model that will work. And there are two reasons why we might get good performance for the wrong reasons. And one is uh, sparseness of data, and the other is overfitting the data. So let's look at each of these uh, problems uh, that we, and, and see if we can figure out what's going on with our example here. Now, data sparseness is another form of overfitting, but it's specifically because we don't have enough instances to figure out the true underlying relationship. Consider this very small data set here. What I've done is I, I've rolled two dice, you know, six-sided game dice, and I've tossed the coin. Uh, so two dice, one coin, I've recorded the outcomes. So I, I rolled a three with one dice, a five with another, and got a heads with the coin. I did that four times and recorded the four instances here. Now, we know that there are six possible outcomes for rolling a dice. Uh, I've got two dice, two outcomes for a coin toss. That's six times six times two. That's 72 possible instances we could have had, but we only have four. So I give these four instances to Weka. I say, come up with a rule that allows me to predict the coin toss from the roll of the dice. And it comes up with a model. If die number one is greater than two, then the outcome of the coin toss is heads. Otherwise, uh, it's tails. And that fits the data we've got here 100% correct. But of course, if we had additional instances, then hopefully Weka would see that there is no correlation. These are random outcomes. So this is the problem of overfitting due to data sparseness. And this is a real problem with our signal peptide because we've recorded seven different residues around the cleavage site. So uh, each of them can be one of 20 residues. So that's 20 to the seven possible patterns. We've got the position. There's about 60 different integers there. The two class values, that's 153 billion possible instances of which we have 1,400 positive ones and an equal number of negative ones, a tiny fraction. Uh, so that's data sparseness. Um, overfitting in general can be indicated when the model is overly complex, such that the tests practically uniquely identify instances. So the model splits instances into lots of very small subsets. And a telltale sign of this is the model is complex, highly branching. And that's what we see from our example here. And we can usually tell if we've been overfitting, if we could just get some more data, if we tried to predict it on the basis of the tree we learned, uh, we'd get poor performance. But of course, we don't often have extra data. So given these characteristics of an overfitting model, I would look at the decision tree we've got here and suggest that it is overfitting. And one way to test that is I've actually prepared a data set with three times as many negative instances I'll just go back and uh, load up file two here, SIG data two. That's got th same as data one, only with uh, three times as many negative instances. We'll just go back to classify under the same default settings. We'll go ahead and start it up. And now, if we look at the accuracy, which we'll see it's even gone up, 82.5%. But if we look at the true positive rate of the cleavage class, it's actually down to almost 50%. That it's practically a coin toss in its accuracy in predicting the very thing we're interested in. Is this the cleavage site? So this doesn't look like a very uh, fruitful way of going about trying to predict the cleavage site.
So our amino acid context approach appears to be overfitting the data. So what else could we try? Well, we might look for a different set of features that capture the more general properties of signal peptides. So a more informed approach, uh, which we might uh, learn about by consulting an expert, a biologist, is uh, we assume that the cleavage occurs because of physical forces at the molecular level. That is, amino acids have electrochemical properties. So we might create features that capture those physical chemical properties of amino acids around the cleavage site or of the signal peptide as a whole. So we can get some domain knowledge from the experts. So what kind of knowledge would we get? Well, this diagram here shows a, uh, a distribution of the amino acids at positions relative to the uh, cleavage site. So if we uh, look at the minus one position, that is the uh, amino acids immediately upstream of the cleavage site. And here the size of the letters is proportional to the frequency of the amino acid type at that position. So we'll see at the minus one position, there's a lot of A's, quite a few G's, S's, some C's and T's. At the minus three position, we see A's, V's, S's and T's. And uh, also sort of the region five to 15 upstream, we see there's a lot of L's and V's and A's. So what's going on here? What are the uh, electrochemical properties of A's and L's and V's that we might ex exploit to capture this non-uniform distribution in these relative positions? Well, it turns out that amino acids have well-known types. They can be uh, uh, molecules that tend to not like being near water. They're called hydrophobic. And we see on the right side of this Venn diagram, you've got AVP, MLF. These are all hydrophobic amino acids. And uh, on the other side, we've got the hydrophilic ones, the ones that like to be near water. We also have some acid, um, amino acids are positively charged and some are negatively charged. And this affects whether or not they stick together, of course. And then the rest are not really very charged. And there are residues with small side chains, the, the bit the, the molecule that uh, distinguishes one residue from another. So we've got AVP, G, C, N, and S. They all have small side chains, and the other ones are somewhat larger. So these are the kind of uh, properties we could record about uh, the molecule around the cleavage site. And in fact, uh, biologists know of the physical chemical properties around signal peptides, and they talk about this thing called the C region, the H region, and the N region. Now, the C region is just those three, four, five, six residues immediately upstream of the cleavage site. Uh, they're usually uncharged at position minus three, and the minus one position are small. They have a small side chain. Uh, adjacent to that, upstream is the H region, about eight residues long. That was all the L's and V's we saw, and it tends to be a hydrophobic region. And then uh, above that, to the beginning of the protein, is the N region, tends to be positively charged. So this is information we can use to construct more informed features. So we, the possible features we might include are the size, the charge, the polarity, and the general hydrophobicity of regions of the signal peptide, especially at position minus one and minus three, because they seem to be quite distinct. We might compute the total hydrophobicity in an approximate H region, just about five to 15 upstream of the cleavage site. We might look at the total charge, polarity, and hydrophobicity in the C region and so on, and then record whether or not that's the cleavage site. So for a couple of uh, randomly chosen residues, which are not the cleavage site, we'll compute these same features. In fact, I've created a data set which just includes the following four features. The position, as we had before, it's the same as the length in the previous data set. The overall hydropathy of the approximate H region, uh, the side chain size for the minus one residue, and the charge of the minus three residue. So if we go back to Weka here, we'll just uh, load in the file three is the one I prepared here. I'll just load it in. And here we can see the position, the charge at the minus three position, whether or not it's small in the minus one position, and the overall hydrophobicity here, the H region, which you'll see is a numeric value. There are charts of uh, general hydrophobicity uh, for amino acids, and I've just summed them up for a region upstream of the uh, cleavage site. So let's go back to J48. Uh, it's still all set up here for tenfold cross-validation. We'll start her off under the default settings. And if we look at our accuracy here, we've got, we've got holy smokes, 91.5% accuracy. Now, that's great. Now, is this all just because we're predicting one class? So we look at the true positive rate, and we'll see 
we've got an average true positive rate of almost 92 percent so that's quite good but we might ask ourselves are we overfitting the data now if we look at the model it's going to be quite small uh, because we don't have very many features so maybe this is a little on the big side to the screen here so we might wonder are we overfitting the data have we got a problem of data sparseness well once again i can generate three times as many negative instances to see if uh if we're just getting sort of a random outcome so we'll go back to pre-process here open the file sig data 4 it's the same as sig data 3 but with three times as many negative instances i'll load them all in here we've got 5620 instances I'll go back to classify same default settings go ahead and start it up and let's look at the accuracy first of all accuracy has gone up almost 94 percent but let's look at those true positive rates here we see that our average true positive rate for our two classes has still remained high 94 percent and this indicates in fact that the model has been relatively good at discriminating between cleavage sites and non-cleavage sites and in fact if we look at the model if we visualize the tree uh, we can see a number of features here at the top of the tree it's looked at the H region which we knew was useful in predicting the uh, cleavage site and then it's looked at the uh, smallness of the minus one position and so on so overall this looks like it might possibly be capturing in a formal model the general principles biologists told us all about when we're doing uh, bioinformatics, the considerations we have when doing data mining is we have to ask ourselves, what's our overall goal? Do we want predictive accuracy or explanatory power? How do we prepare the data uh, to generate features which are actually going to be useful for solving our problem? And how can we evaluate how good the model is that we get, knowing that Weka is going to do its best to come up with a, a highly accurate model, and it may do so under spurious circumstances? And most importantly, uh, bioinformatics is an instance where data mining really is a collaborative experience. So seek expert advice whenever you can. I've set up some exercises, some activities for you to do where you can explore bioinformatics and signal peptide prediction more thoroughly. Enjoy.